This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with Masters of Horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now today's guest is Max Booth III. This is the first time in over three years that Max has been on the podcast and he has done so much since then. He has got into screenwriting, well not just got into screenwriting, he screenwrote, he adapted his own book, We Need to Do Something, into an amazing film. You can watch it now. It is available on demand, so please seek it out. We need to do something. He's also started the podcast, Ghoulish Podcast, started a book festival, Ghoulish Book Fest, and most recently he released a new novel, Maggot Screaming. And let me tell you this, there are big things in the future for Max, because he is a phenomenal talent. And, you know, I don't know if I've ever said it like that before, but he just is, and I think... We are going to see so many of his films on the big screen in the future. There's going to be a lot more books available. He is going to become a household name within the horror community and beyond. So watch this space. And in this episode, we talk about a lot. We really delve into his start in terms of screenwriting. There's quite a lot of technical questions about that. We then talk about his strategy for releasing the book of We Need to Do Something. Talk a little about Ghoulish Podcast. And his forthcoming book, Indiana Death Song. So, plenty to get into. But before any of that, a little bit of an advert break. The Crystal Lake Academy is launching this year, and the first step in that launch is the author's journey. Crystal Lake Publishing founder and CEO Joe Meinhardt, along with several editors, including Kenneth W. Kane, Angela Yukiro Smith, and Kevin Lucia, want to facilitate your writing journey for three months, from June 15th to September 15th. You'll be part of an interactive community working to improve your craft and getting a short story or manuscript ready for submission. Find out more info and purchase options on the Crystal Lake website at www.crystallakepub.com. Tenebus Press presents Lure, a novella of otherworldly folk horror by Tim McGregor. In a fishing village on an alien shore hang the bones of ancient forsaken gods. The arrival of a new god brings descent and madness and threatens to tear the starving community apart. Against the backdrop of brine and blood, Lure blurs the line between natural disaster and self-destruction. Eric LaRocca calls Lure a monstrously inventive fable, immersive and utterly compelling. Pre-order at TenebusPress.com now. Lure is out July 18th. All right, and with that said, here it is. It is Max Booth third on This Is Horror. Max, welcome back to This Is Horror. Yeah, hey. So one of the things that you've done since we last spoke is became a screenwriter. So you wrote... The adaptation to your novella, We Need to Do Something, that is now out in the world. So, I mean, to take it all the way back, when did you first become interested in screenwriting? Yeah, so I have a friend who lives in Austin. I live in San Antonio. It's about a a 60-minute drive. His name is Shane McKenzie, and he used to only write books, lots of, like, extreme bizarro books full presses like dead eye press and eventually he he uh, he got lucky with screenwriting and he realized oh wait 
throw some money in this and there's that money in the the books I'm publishing. So he kind of took a, did a pivot into focusing only on screenwriting and he, he's had some luck with it. His latest project, uh, Bingo Hell, just came out on Amazon Prime. Although because it's Amazon, I do recommend anyone listening to just pirate it instead. Um, so I had lunch with him one day. It was like two or three yields. It was 2019. I can't do that type of math, but 2019, 2018, I don't know. It doesn't matter. No one's taking notes on this. I had lunch with him, and he told me about all the luck he was having with screenwriting. He encouraged me to try writing a screenplay myself. He said he knew some indie production companies that were hungry for uh, original scripts, and like no one else in the, the indie whole writing scene was really interested in writing scripts for some reason when all these opportunities were available. And I'm always up for trying new things. And I had this idea already of a Phil Australia about a family stuck in a bathroom. I wanted to write something real. It began and ended in a bathroom because that seemed funny to me. So I, um, this seemed like a good way to write that because it would be a low budget, one setting, limited cast. So after that lunch, I spent a few months writing that script and I sent it to Shane and he said, okay, I'm going to send it to this production company and we'll see what happens. And then six months passed and... <laughs> They didn't respond, so I guess he was wrong, and I got impatient, so I rewrote it as a novella, and I thought, all right, I know what's, I, I know I know how to do books, don't know how to do screenplays, evidently, but I can write a book, so I rewrote it, I think, feel the best, it changed quite a bit from the original screenplay, wrote it as a novella, I sat on it for a few months, not really sure what to do with it, because agents for some reason will just terrified of considering novellas because it's not long enough and i don't trust a lot of small presses anymore so i just sat on it for a while and in the meantime i got connected with a film and tv manager named ryan lewis i'm sure the uh, Folks who have listened to Josh Mandelman on the podcast know that name. He's also his manager. And uh, fuck, Michael David Wilson's manager. You might know him. <laughs> um, he's you. <laughs> uh, I got connected with him. And he was reading some various projects of my own to just see if there was any film uh, potential. And then COVID happened, and I was working the night shift at the hotel, and a lot of my co workers will let go. And I thought, oh, I'm probably going to get let go soon as well. The hotel next to me completely shut down, and it was pretty frightening. And I thought I need to figure out a way to make some money. So I self-published the novella, We Need to Do Something, through my own small press, pulled Petrol Motion Machine Publishing. I did it in a kind of odd way, meaning I I couldn't be baffled to do any promotion at all, and I just randomly released it on a on a Saturday night, like at 10 p.m. And somehow that got some interest from Riedels, and a lot of people began reading it, and that was fun. And like a week after I released it, Ryan finally got to that novella that I had sent it to him a few weeks before I even released it. He took him a bit to get to it. He read it. He said, this is great. This would make a great movie. You should write this as a script. Then he said, do you want to send me the original script you already wrote? I told him absolutely not because it's really different from the new novella. So I went about rewriting it from scratch, basically as a new script I sent it to Ryan. He gave me some notes. I, I revised it, some little notes, some back and filth. And then he said, okay, this is good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it out to some folks. He sent it to a company called Atlas Productions. No, Atlas Industries. Because um, at the time, maybe they still might be. 
I'm not positive. They will in they will involved in the production of Josh Malleman's uh, book uh, Black Mad Real, I believe is the title. And they sh- Ryan said, "Hey, would you guys want to help produce? We need to do something." And at the time, the the co founder co president of Atlas, Sean King O'Grady, he not only wanted to produce it he wanted to direct it because until then he had directed some documentaries but he was looking into making um what do you call it just like fiction movies <laughs> i don't know um and this seemed like a easy movie to make with covid going on and it kind of was so i mean things just kind of went pretty quickly after that i zoomed with sean in july of 2019 that's how i met him and then we will filming by the beginning of October of the same year. So that doesn't usually happen so quickly. I am discovering now with Edel Projects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the turnaround for everything was remarkably quick. And I mean, there's so much to pick up on here. I mean, one of the things you said about initially when you sent it out to the indie company that Shane had mentioned was six months past and nothing happened. And, you know, I've learned from talking to different people and listening to these conversations that that's kind of the way that it works in screenwriting. If people don't like something, they often just ignore it. (laughs) It's like, there's no, sorry, this wasn't for us. It just, they give you the silent treatment. Not even, I mean, yes, that, but expanding on that, you could be in the process of looking on a project with some someone, a project that they've expressed excitement over, and then suddenly something might go wrong. Maybe they've lost funding to help you, or maybe a new idea has gotten little attention and they don't have any time to continue the project they will doing with you and instead of telling you that they will just proceed to ghost you <laughs> i mean yeah it's really common in the film industry and it's pretty uh pretty fucking annoying yeah yeah and i guess with there only being a limit as to kind of the important people and producers that you want to get this in front of even though they ghost you you or your agent probably has to reach out to the same person when there's another project that they might be interested in. So, I mean, in, yeah. in book publishing, if someone ghosted you, you probably think, well, fuck that person. <laughs> We're never going to contact them again. But yeah, it can't well, you really may have to like reach that. out. You may have to reach out to the same person to say, hey, am I going to get complimentary uh, DVDs of the movie we made last time? <laughs> <laughs> hey that. Bob, can you can you define for the the audience what ghosting means? Well, ghosting is whenever you are basically expecting some type of you know confirmation of something, and you don't get it ever. <laughs> In other words, yeah. like you're waiting, you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and the only way you're ever going to really find out what happened is if you have to contact that person again for something else and you do the oh oh hey by the way i never heard back about the other thing and usually they'll say what other thing <laughs> yeah that's ghosting why do you think it's called ghosting though like do like well ghosts like infamous will just ignoring you <laughs> because i thought the whole thing was they tried to scale you out of houses no that's that's a different type of ghosting. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. What yeah, is it? That would be a different ghosting. What is it with you, Max, and recently getting people to define things? Because I listened to your small town horror <laughs> panel at the Ghoulish Festival, and you just started out by getting people to define town. Yeah, well, I mean, two different answers. Like the one, like I wanted Bob to define ghosting 
because I don't want to take for granted that all the listeners know what ghosting is. And I thought mm-hmm. Bob would give them give the most amusing definition, and I was correct. <laughs> and mm-hmm. the panel you were talking about, um, the topic was small towns, and I wasn't meant to moderate that panel, but I had to um, anyway. And I didn't do any prep, although I don't usually do much prep on anything, I guess. But small towns is a pretty vague topic, and walking up to the stage, I kept thinking, how the fuck am I going to make 50 minutes of content with this? So the first thing that came to mind was, what is a town? I mean, Bob certainly helped out in terms of making the content longer because he spent about 10 minutes talking about throwing stones and boasting that, oh, I'm the one who can throw stones the furthest on this panel. So that was an interesting little... And I was. You were. Oh, wow. Did you have was it was a stone throwing competition part of Ghoulish Festival, whether advertised or impromptu? No, no, but it was pebbles. We did throw pebbles. Oh, okay. Will they uh, fruity at all? I no, they were not fruity. They were cocoa. Oh, nice. That's the best kind. The best. <laughs> well, that's that cleared up. Thank goodness yeah. for that. Was that a Patreon question? <laughs> No, no, we didn't get too many of those. <laughs> A moment of silence. Oh, okay, Max, oh, I'm literally, laughing. Max literally <laughs> muted his mic. I thought Max was <laughs> deliberately no. doing some long silent shit. You know, it's been a while since we talked. I've I've discovered new tricks to podcasting, like <laughs> muting my mic when I when I go to drink. Yeah. Yeah, I also one. don't like I don't hold the mic now and like move it around as I talk. I, I have to schedule that's a bad thing to do. <laughs> it's not an <laughs> ideal thing to do, yeah. Yeah. So that was but, like my second podcast I'd ever done, I think. It was it was on J. David Osborne's podcast and mm. I was just holding it and just moving it around as I talked because I didn't realize it would make noise the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, going back to screenwriting, you spoke about working with Ryan on We Need to Do Something and getting a load of notes from him. So I'm wondering what were some of the most instrumental notes in terms of your development as a screenwriter? I think the biggest note he kept giving me, and it's so obvious in retrospect, it's just keeping track of like real the entire cast is at all times because it is a one setting movie. So the, the cast is in the same room the whole time. And like when you write it as a book and it's in someone's uh, point uh, POV, like the book is Phil's Pills and POV. So sh- that kill tool isn't always going to be like consider it or even give a shit about what the mom might be doing at all times. But when it's a movie, you have a screen and you see everybody anyway. So you need to know what they might be doing. So just kind of like taking that under consideration, what everybody might be doing, just keeping track of small details like that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so how many drafts did you go through if we need to do something? I don't know. Um, Maybe three or so. No, that's not true. Maybe five. I mean, it's not like I did the one rewrite in the beginning before Ryan saw it mm-hmm. whatsoever. And in my head, when I think of drafts, I think of rewrite, like a complete rewrite. But maybe that's not true because like, after that, it was just like, you should do a pass of this and correct this specific thing. Like, is does that count as a new draft? I don't know. I guess it's open for interpretation. I mean, for for me, I'd I'd probably call it a new draft. Depends oh. if I if I go through from start to finish. <laughs> oh fuck me! <laughs> Who let the dogs out? Yeah, he didn't like that answer, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that is. Yeah, I would, I would say it <laughs> that was not an approved through, response. Yeah, that was not an approved response. I would say probably going through and fixing one thing would not be a draft. You could call it one, but technically, no. To me, a draft is like starting over, like a whole new document. Which, yeah, yeah. Man, I hate that, but you know, I mean, I do. Got to do whatever it takes. It's you know, yeah. Well, I mean, it's something. I, go ahead. Well, I was going to say at the moment with the 
the screenplay that Bob and I are working on, I'd say we, you know, we've done the second draft, but the second draft of Act One because we're writing each act and then sending it to Ryan to get comment. And so, of course, me and Bob have had lots of back and forth and going over different scenes. But it was, you know, once we finalize something and sent it to Ryan. So I suppose for me, anytime you send something to Ryan, that is a draft. <laughs> Unless okay. it was just a quick yeah. email. So so the, the draft that everyone is looking to get is final drafts. <laughs> Ooh. Mm. So I do have some real thoughts about this now that we've talked a bit. As I was on set of the movie, the dra- I did do multiple drafts then. Because I physically had to write draft one, draft two, draft three, and so on. Because so it's always just draft one technically until the movie goes into production. Okay, so everything until then remains what is called a the um, the white draft, right? I think that's what it's called. Shit, I'm blanking on it. Yeah, white draft. Everything until you go into production is like the pre-draft, basically. And then once production begins, that is considered the white draft. And then it becomes locked. So if you make any uh, corrections or revisions after that, you have to call it like blue draft. And it's a completely new document. And you see on the screenplay itself... Like it will be in, um, sometimes it might be in red text where the new revisions might be, or you just might see an asterisk, uh, like to the right of the page showing an edit was made in this section. And, um, another thing that happens as you're in production and you go through these different, uh, drafts is the page count remains the same always. So for instance, my screenplay was 97 pages long. But I had to make corrections through it, and it ended up becoming longer. But instead of saying it, be, instead of it becoming like ninety eight, ninety nine pages, say if I made a, a correction on page five, and it and it spilled over to the next page, that would become page five A, and then five B, and so on until the revision was done, because they have to in the system and in the. Um, well, the um, what do you call it? The set notes and the um, the camera shots and all the all the stuff they do in pre production to plan this. Those notes can't just keep being changed to a cut to a to adjust to the new revisions. So that's why it changes the five A five B. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. it does. Was was that something in terms of the page count that you could automatically do on either Final Draft or Highland Two, whatever you were using for this one? Yeah, yeah. So I wrote it in Highland Two, but everybody, everybody involved in the actual movie on production, they freaked out and they were like, "Oh no, you have to do Final Draft." So I converted it to Final Draft, and that does it automatically once you lock the script. And right. locking the script is just an option in the final draft. Yeah. So you pretty much had to buy final draft just to convert it to the file that they wanted. Is that right? Well, I would have, but I already had bought it before even uh, meeting Ryan. And mm. Ryan was the one who got me on Highland, too. Actually, I, I neglected to mention something in my my, my screenwriting mythos. Before I'd even met Shane, um, before I had had that lunch with Shane, I had written one of the screenplay for an uh, adaptation of my book, Kilnivalous Lunal Activities, at the mm. um, encouragement of a, of a person who I'm not going to name who maybe promised me a certain amount of money for writing it and then didn't pay it and said they never promised me anything. And he told me, oh, you can't use any other writing program except for Final Draft. And, well, I mean, I don't. it shouldn't be true, but it kind of feels like it is just because of what happened when I was on set. Right. But I don't think that's something you really need to be concerned about until your movie is fucking bought and it's going to be filmed. Just write on Highland too because yeah. it's free. Just do that, and if for some reason you get lucky and you do sell on script and you do go to on set and you have to do this, then yeah, go and buy Final Draft. I'm sure you will be able to have filled it. Yeah, if you've sold a script by then. Yeah, right. yeah. And so I, I'm wondering in terms of like 
now when you're writing a script when you're starting out do you prefer to start in highland 2 or are you just starting in final draft i begin in highland 2 because it's easy to um bounce it back and forth with ryan and to see his uh, notes on it it's just it's also just easier to write and i think it's really smooth it's not overly complicated like final draft can be final draft has a lot of useless uh, like bells and, and whistles to it that, that no one really needs mm. so i like highland too i don't know why it's called highland too i should look that up but was did they do an original one and they went oh we should do a sequel i don't understand the naming uh process with it but it's good yeah yeah so when you're sending it to to ryan you're sending the highland 2 file yeah yeah i'm not converting it to a pdf i'm just sending the actual thing and then he can use um what the what is basically track changes mm. on it it's like yeah. called revision build yeah on. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob and I are very familiar with that because obviously bouncing it back and yeah. forth. And honestly, the the only thing that isn't in the program that I would like it to have is if the track changes much like Word when something was deleted, if there was just a note to show exactly what was deleted. But yeah, yeah, I agree. I wish it did have that. Yeah, yeah. You have to keep multiple drafts on file. If you do start cutting, because if you need to add something back, you're not going to, and you may remember, but you, you probably need to look at what it, you originally wrote if you yeah. want to put something back in. And then you just got to basically copy and paste. But and it's that would be a nice addition to be able to see what was deleted. Does yeah. John August listen to this podcast? Maybe he can add that to I it. hope so. Yeah, that because be I listen to his podcast, and I think that's how it works. If I listen to someone's, then they will be obligated to listen to mine. I I, I should give that a go. I should begin listening to a lot, to a lot more podcasts. Maybe more people would listen to mine. <laughs> it's it, it's a, a strategy you could consider, but I mean, I mean, talking about you know the the white draft and then naming them d different colors essentially i mean i can see because you sent me you know, your screenplay for we need to do yeah. something i see you've got the white draft the blue draft the pink canary green golden rod and finally black void it, <laughs> this is probably a stupid question but <laughs> is that like the official color scheme that it has to follow? <laughs> or did, so you, I, did you just, can you just do any color? Because I kind of hope that it is the official one, particularly if, you know, after green, you have to jump to golden rod. So I, I Googled it and it is the official one until, what was the one before Black Draft, uh, Black Void? Dude, that's golden rod. <laughs> Yeah, so that was the last one listed, and the, this, the, like two days away from us wrapping, I had to make one last adjustment to the script, and I texted uh, Sean, the director, and I said, what's after a golden rod? I don't know what to put. There's nothing online. And he just said, I don't know, Black Void? <laughs> I said, okay, I'm using that. So I, I changed it to Black Void, and when I emailed it to the um, like the script assistant and like all the the – assistant producers and whatnot I, in the email i said sean gave me permission to call this one black void do not yell at me <laughs> well there you go which is which is funny because i mean that brings up something Dude, that happened yeah i i googled <laughs> there's some more so it shouldn't have been black i can't th this just seems like a parody somebody's name so after golden rod we've got <laughs> we've got buff We've got buff draft. <laughs> buff draft. Wait, then we've what, got wait, salmon, you said buff, salmon. like B U F F, right? B U F F buff draft. That, what color is Sam that? I don't know. <laughs> what fucking color are some of, some of these ones coming up? Um, then we've got salmon salmon draft. <laughs> then we've got cherry draft, and then after cherry, we go to second blue. Second pink, second <laughs> yellow, <laughs> second green, second golden rod, second buff, second salmon, and then second cherry. And I guess that's that a, if, 
if you that's get a misconception this... you only get one chili and you lose it pretty uh, that, well, yeah, yeah i do yeah, find exactly. it funny they've included carry in this i but... think we should petition to get black void who, who are we yeah, gonna petition pickle. john august no <laughs> who mean... are we petitioning William You're Goldman. This fucking, yeah, no shit. <laughs> William Goldman. Let's just resurrect his corpse and talk to him. I'll get it, it handled. <laughs> Rest ben. in peace, Goldman. Ben. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. That was fun. I hope I hope that was interesting for people. They've learned all the color schemes and I mean they they learned like seven of them. <laughs> then like whoever made that list you were reading, they just went, ah, let's just repeat them, I guess, because yeah. that's all of them. Yeah, so I I can only assume then as it's not listed that if you get even further you have to repeat again. Okay, third blue. <laughs> I feel like they had a, like a eight pack of Crayola crayons. <laughs> That's all they had exactly. listed. <laughs> yeah, not even an eight pack. They have like uh, yeah, it's probably eight. <laughs> well, they had like eight, but like the dog consumed two of them. <laughs> right. It could have been like the the four pack you get with like the Happy Meal or something like that. Yeah, like when you go to a restaurant and they yeah. give it to some asshole kid to keep them distracted <laughs> from like pooping on the ceiling. I don't know. <laughs> You know yeah. what I'm talking about, Bob. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> now what, guys? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I understand, too, that, I mean, you've done some directing before. As you've written and directed some short films. So is that kind of now something you're looking to get into on the big screen? Is there any movement in terms of that no movement but something i'm definitely uh interested in doing someday that type of thing is pretty terrifying to me because i don't understand a lot about the technical side of filmmaking yet i'm trying to to uh teach myself and spill moments of my my day but uh, it's I don't know. It's a lot, and it stresses me out because I know, like, it's really easy to fuck things up. Yeah, and like, I yeah, like I directed like one short film, but like it was just me, my iPhone, a boom mic, and like three friends overnight just fucking around. I mean, I think it's I think it ended up being pretty cool, but be going beyond that tech uh, technology wise is frightening to me. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of when you were screenwriting, did you initially kind of put many directorial notes in and then subsequently had to edit them out? Because I know that's a kind of classic mistake when I was researching that people starting off can often make, you know, they're the writer, but they're adding more directorial observations, which just isn't your job at that point. Um, no, not with the original ones I did, although I recently finished the screenplay with some directing notes because I was thinking I might direct it. Mm. But um, after some conversation with um, Ryan, mm. we, I think I'm going to rewrite it as a pilot to a TV show. So I'll probably get, uh, get rid of all the directing notes as I revise and trim it down and reimagine it because, I mean, it's a really different medium and... I don't need to have directing notes in it. I probably don't need directing notes in any scripts, but I wrote it specifically with myself directing it in mind. So I guess I was thinking about it a slightly different. Yeah. Are you able to say which film that is that you're talking about? Yeah, it's in uh, my book, The Nightly Disease. I mean, there's no movement on it. It's just stuff that we'll be looking on behind the scenes and hoping to uh, shop once I am done. So, I mean, nothing official is going on with it at this point. Yeah. So what, what was the logic to go from movie to TV show? Why does that particular book seem to work better as a TV show? or Or, or is it? Not that, but Ryan kind of wants you to have both a film and a TV show version so that when shopping it around, there's both ready to go. It's funny. I, I had We had both already kind of figured it should be a TV show before I even wrote it as a movie. 
but I kept insisting we should try doing a movie script anyway, because in my head, I guess I thought, well, we sold one movie. Let's, we could do it again. Right. And, um, <laughs> and the reason why it will spare the loss of TV show is, well, one, there's a lot of different councils going on. And I don't think in a movie script version, we were able to spend enough time with them to really get to know why they were fun to watch. So in the TV show, we can kind of expand that mill. And plus, it's a I think it's a setting that is perfect for a TV show. It's a hotel. We have people coming in and out constantly. We can have so many mini plots going on with each new guest coming in. It feels really uh, episodic. Even the novel itself which was something I struggled with a bit trying to make it a movie is a lot of the, the book is a, is, is episodic and that just seems like it should, it should translate to a TV show instead of a movie. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what other screenwriting projects are you working on now? Cause I mean, my understanding from talking to you and seeing the different things that you're doing is that you are working on multiple projects at any given time. Yeah, I uh, recently wrote a pilot for a TV show that I can't talk about. I was, um, it was not um, on spec. I was solicited by a, a filmmaker in LA to write a pilot and do like the um the season one bible of what would the other episodes be like based on an idea that the um the filmmaker gave me it's not an original creation of mine but it was fun to do it and you know it paid it paid some builds and that was always fun i wish i can get some bill paid screenwriting gigs that that would be the dream um i'm about to begin writing a script based on my book maggot screaming which just came out and i do intend to somehow direct this one not sure yet how but i feel like i can maybe at the very least do like a fucking john waddles version of it and just go completely diy and make it with my friends i am probably going to i have a lot of screenplays i'm doing on spec i have nothing really going on that i'm being paid to do that's in production. I have a screenplay of my book, Carnivalous Lunal Activities, floating around. But at the moment, nothing's happening Happening with that for reasons I can't get into. And hmm. that's about it, I think, screenwriting-wise. My book, Touch the Night, was optioned for TV, but I'm not writing the script. And I can't say who it's been picked up by, but... A pilot is in the process of being written. And I, you know, I hope things continue happening with that project because I'm, I, I need money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope it, I hope it begins filming. <laughs> right. For, yeah. for those who don't know, in like the filmmaking business, when you write a screenplay, you do get like an option fee. So let's say I have a book called Touch the Night. And the company optioned it, and they paid ten thousand bucks just to have the exclusivity of it. And then also in that same contract is how much they would pay if the show actually got made. But but that payment doesn't happen until day one of filming. The same thing happened if we we need to do something. Yeah, I got a small, a really small option fee with that one with the promise of paying mill money once day one of filming happened. So like I drove to Michigan to be on set. And when I arrived, <laughs> like I still hadn't gotten paid yet. I got paid like the next day, but it was like, man, <laughs> please don't fuck me over guys. Cause I'm taking a big gamble on this. Yeah. So I think, I think maybe a lot of people don't realize that who will not involved in the industry. Like, yeah, you could sell a lot of scripts, uh, but you will only going to get a small portion of the payment until and if it actually goes into production. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if this part is going to be <laughs> part of the show or on air, but I vaguely remember you talking about 
And this may have just been a private conversation that we had, hence it might not be able to be part of the episode. But I vaguely remember you said something like, you put a tweet out about ninjas or you pretended to be an expert on ninjas or something <laughs> like that. And then the next moment, there was someone who kind of was asking you to write a ninja TV series or, or, or thought you were an expert. So th this is, I think, a few years ago at least now. But one, is that anything you could talk about? on air and do you yeah. even know what the hell i'm talking about here yeah um this was in 2020 and we my uh, my parent Noel, Louis michelle and i went to uh lowe's to buy some plants to uh, redo the gildan and when i was walking out i realized i was holding a really giant plant <laughs> it made me look like uh, what's those video games oh, called God. Yeah, like a like metal gill salad metal type metal thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I made a little take a photo of me in the middle of the parking lot, and like half my body was concealed by this plant. And I posted <laughs> that, and I said something how like I'm the shittiest ninja alive. And then um, Sean King O'Grady, who uh, directed We Need to Do Something, <laughs> this was when we were still trying to get funds for We Need to Do Something. So I knew him; he was following me, but like the movie wasn't a full show thing yet. He's <laughs> He messaged me saying, do you like ninjas? Because I've been obsessed with trying to make a ninja movie or a ninja TV show. And I don't give a shit about ninjas. But I said, yeah, man, they all my passion. So there was a long uh, back and forth about like <laughs> researching ninjas and stuff. And I did do some research into them and like what a ninja show might be like. But then nothing happened with it, which is something that is just common. Things just don't follow through. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten the detail that you'd been hiding behind a potted plant. Like, <laughs> like the, <laughs> as, you, as you say it now, like it's even more ridiculous than I remembered it being. <laughs> like it's just really nothing to even do with ninjas. You use the word ninja. <laughs> it's funny it's funny uh that that like moment in time inspired this uh, song that we sing around the house called shitty ninja it right. would be the theme song to a show about like the real ninja live and base i mean it's basically just singing the title of bill noble like uh shitty ninja <laughs> shitty ninja shitty ninja and like in my head, it would be like a like a like a mockumentary type of show. Yeah. Well, this yeah. well, this camera guy is always like blowing the like the hideout. Like obviously, a ninja is not going to be good at hiding if there's a camera crew hiding uh, following him. Yeah, it's really funny to me. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I I hope if one thing can come out of this podcast. <laughs> It's that someone listens to this stupid segue about ninjas and then commissions you to write the TV show Shitty Ninja. I mean, that just feels like a great kind of Adult Swim style Tim and Eric kind of comedy. I yeah. I want to see yeah. that. Like, I recently began watching a uh, Delocated. And that's kind of similar. But it's about a family in witness protection, but they're filming it. <laughs> and it's so funny. Like you'll just, bl <laughs> I mean, if anyone hasn't seen that, I highly recommend Dude, it. It's I haven't seen it, concept. but I Googled it. And <laughs> the first few images I see are ridiculous. <laughs> it's so fucking funny. <laughs> so like they're, they're, they're being filmed while they're. Yeah. Yeah. We're we'll making a TV show out of it. <laughs> It sounds like fucking everyone knows that they're in the witness protection program. Yep, that's the joke. <laughs> yeah, God, and like within three, within like three. Ep I mean, this is this is spoiling like two episodes into the season, but like an assass a Russian assassin begins trying to kill them, mm -hmm. and they decide that the camera, co the film company, they decide they should do a spinoff show filming <laughs> that guy trying to kill the oh family. <laughs> oh, dude, dude, this is. Wait, I didn't even know about this show. It's called Delocated. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start watching this soon. The three three <laughs> seasons, twenty nine oh, wow. episodes, and a pilot, and this went on for five years. <laughs> <laughs> See, they make so too good. many damn shows, man. I never even heard of this thing, and it sounds great. 
Yeah, I mean, it passed me by too. I've only recently began watching it. I'm only like halfway into season one. So I'm, I can't wait to like see who the fuck else it goes at this point. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh. Yeah, I'm so up for watching this. <laughs> it looks absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Well, I mean, with We Need to Do Something, you, the book, you spoke about how you just kind of randomly released it on a Saturday night at 10 p.m. I'm wondering, did, did you work with an editor on this one or was it so kind of spontaneous you just threw it out into the world? I, uh, my, my publishing and uh, my life uh did the editing on this one. Yeah. And usually most of the books I do because... I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I recommend hiring someone to edit a book. But if you happen to live with someone and like yeah. sleep with someone who uh, is pretty good at editing, and I just recommend having them do it for free. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a bad life advice. I don't know. Bad publishing advice. Though it's funny, that book specifically, I recall I was like laying in bed reading or something and she was in the office Mm -hmm. uh, editing it and when she finished she came into the room and fucking threw the stack of papers at me and said <laughs> fuck you <laughs> because it was a really sad moment in the book yeah. <laughs> and it affected all quite a bit yeah yeah i mean a lot of people yeah reacted to this book in similar ways and i suppose also perhaps up until this point you'd been known more for humor writing and obviously there is humor in we need to do something but i mean i think it's quite clearly your darkest book by a considerable margin so people weren't ready for that it's interesting i definitely gained a lot of new readers with uh both we need to do something and touch the night which mm. both came out within a few months of each other. And both of those books are mostly not funny. They have comedic elements. Yeah. And it's not the focus, say, like, Colonialist Lunal Activities, right? Or The Nightly Disease. So I, so I got a bunch of new uh, readers and followers with those two books specifically. And now I just released a new book that is just, just nonstop, like, just, like, flatulent jokes. And it's just, it's not... I mean, it is kind of a little book, but it's mostly uh, just comedy. And I am already seeing like a difference in people showing any interest in this. It's like, oh, oh shit. I guess silly is a little now is the way to go. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I mean, well. it's, it sounds like then, you know, you might have two distinct fan bases. So you'll have some people yeah. who are more there for carnivorous lunar activities and maggot screaming and then other people who are more the kind of we need to do something touch the night camp and i mean sick fucks is what i call them yeah yeah sick fucks yeah i mean i <laughs> yeah i i love both modes um i mean pro probably for me like carnivorous lunar activities and the nightly disease there uh, <laughs> are amongst my favorites but that's just the kind of immature stupid fucking humor i have so yeah what does you, that you say about me well good news for those the folks who would prefer like a uh, milicilious stuff i am a little over halfway at the moment on a novella that is really depressing and not funny at all and I, I hope you come and buy that one when it comes out because sometimes I feel like I'm wasting my fucking time with this one because there's no jokes at all. And even we need to do something and touch the night. They had humor to them to a degree. But the thing I'm doing now, which I'm calling uh, Indiana Death Song, mm. <laughs> it's just it's mm. pretty just fucking gloomy. And I don't know what to expect of reactions with this one. Mm. Is that is it difficult for you to write with no humor? I mean, like yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. answer is yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I want to. I can. It's not. I think it's difficult for me to do it without humor on like a book length thing because most of my uh, most of my short stories will not really humorous. They're mm. pretty serious. Yeah, and. Usually I'm trying to capture a specific mood in what I'm writing 
And I, I guess my thought is with uh, long books, you need some comedy to keep them interested. But with a short story, you can easily just capture a type of mood and vibe just long enough until the end of the book, the, the story. So that's my main, I guess, like philosophy with that. The novella I'm doing right now, it has to maintain this type of I, I guess depressing vibe is what I'm going for, mainly because it's based on a depressing time in my life, mm. and the way it's being written doesn't allow for much humor because there's not a lot of dialogue in it, and almost all of my uh, comedy comes through dialogue. It doesn't really come from like the co- the concept or yeah. the like like some some uh, writers like say Chris uh, Christopher Mill. Well, Vonnegut, they get a lot of jokes just from the way they write sentences. Hmm. But myself, when I do comedy in my writing, it kind of comes from dialogue and uh, reactions to things. So it's slightly different, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, how do you find, if at all, that like writing in this comedic mode and writing in this dark mode, just to simplify. I mean, how does that affect your mindset? Does it make you like mentally more wary? Is it a harder kind of thing for you to be writing these really dark books? Yeah, it's pretty exhausting. I mean, this book specifically is about my, my childhood when I uh, grew up in a hotel and uh, it wasn't a great fun time. So just having to just like relive this stuff again while writing it, it's like, that's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be doing this, but I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then uh, can I, I can yeah. go back now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder along similar lines, if you're going through a difficult time in your life, would you then prefer to write something lighter or almost as an escape from that? Or would you prefer to write something darker to almost capitalize on those emotions and the shit that you're going through or perhaps it doesn't work like that at all and it's just a matter of you know where the money or where the idea is at that particular time i don't know if it's something i've thought about but if i had to guess i probably do like if i'm feeling already pretty uh, gloomy i probably mm-hmm. do just lean into that a bit yeah, but I don't know if it's something I've ever like uh, consciously, consciously uh, thought about too much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, something you've done since we last spoke to you, seeing as it's been over three years, is start a brand new podcast. Maybe not that brand new for people listening who have probably checked it out, but ghoulish podcast. So, how did that come about? Yeah, I, I don't know when this episode's going live, but uh, episode one of uh, Ghoulish launched on like June second of twenty nineteen, I believe. Yeah, and it came about. I don't know. I don't. Know, I don't fucking know. Um, <laughs> I guess I wanted to like challenge you guys and see who would win in podcasting. I thought, ha ha. Michael's been smug and smug enough with his podcast. Why don't I uh, show him up a little? <laughs> um, I have this odd um, fascination with late night TV show hosts. And it's something I've always just wanted to be for some reason, probably due to just an unchecked massive ego. But this seems like the closest way I could able get to that, I guess. And also, at the time, I was doing a different podcast called Castle Rock Radio, which was Stephen King-specific. And I kept thinking, like, with the folks we uh, published through the small press, like, I wanted to do, like, a mini, like, a spinoff podcast of us just interviewing the authors about, like, the projects they were working on. But often it didn't make sense to do it with Castle Rock because listeners came to find out to listen about Stephen King shit, not about what people have written. So, I'm sorry, I'm fighting my dog who's trying to get into a trash can. God damn it, friend, stop it. (laughs) Um... (laughs) What a great, what a great uh, fucking episode this is. 
you feel very weird. I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, I got it now. So it just, I kept wanting to do as all different things. Like I recall at some point, I think I pitched to you, Michael, a, a podcast called, uh, I have an idea for a podcast because at the time <laughs> yeah. I had so yeah. many different ideas for podcasts I wanted to do. So I thought it would be fun to do this podcast called, I have an idea for a podcast, but each episode we would take films pitching a podcast <laughs> and then we would recall an episode of that podcast and that would be the episode. And I still think that's a pretty good idea, to be honest. Well, but let, that, let's, it, let's so, leave it up to the listeners then. Let, you know, if enough of you want to hear this, we'll do at least a pilot of, <laughs> of that show. So, you know, contact us either via Patreon, via Twitter, you know, just get in touch. I think if we did do it, it wouldn't be an ongoing thing, but maybe like... Like a 10 episode season, maybe, you know what I mean? Like yeah. a, just a mini show, like kind of like um, Andy Daly has a great podcast. I'm going to fuck up the title, but it's called like Andy Daly's project, uh, podcast pilot, pilot project. Mm. And it's basically the pilot. Oh, wait. Fuck. It's my idea. <laughs> it's the it's the pilot to different podcast ideas he has. Disregard everything. I was just stealing his idea, I think. <laughs> Have you just realized after all these years that you pitched yeah. a show that yeah. already existed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's so close that now I wouldn't even do it. It's too close to that idea. Okay, so Great if, you, podcast. If, if, you, if you started writing in, then just <laughs> delete, delete the email, delete the tweet, forget it. It's cancelled. Thank you so much for listening to part one of the conversation with Max Booth Third. Join us again next time for the second and final part of the conversation. But if you would like to get that ahead of the crowd, if you would like to get every episode ahead of the crowd, become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to each and every episode, but you get to submit questions to each interviewee. You get to become a member of Discord, the Writers Forum, and you get exclusive podcasts like Story Unboxed, a horror podcast on the craft of writing. And talking about Discord and the Writers Forum, we are going to be doing another challenge at the start of July. It's a little like the one story per week, but this time it's more a choose your own adventure. So you can do one story per week for a year, or you can write a novella every month, or you can write a novel in 90 days. And the cool thing is you can flip between these challenges during the year. So maybe you want to get warmed up, you want to do one story a week for the first month. Boom, four stories. And then maybe after you think, well, I'll have a go at a novella. That's the next month. And then after that, well, it's the big one. It's time to write a novel in 90 days. And, you know, we've got a tremendously supportive community on Discord. So we're all going to be cheering each other on. If you want to be part of that. Join us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash this is horror. We're going to be chatting with Catriona Ward soon, so if you're a patron, you can submit a question for her too, as well as every guest. So lots to play for, lots for your money. Head over, patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Tenebus Press presents Lure, a novella of otherworldly folk horror by Tim McGregor. In a fishing village on an alien shore hang the bones of ancient forsaken gods. The arrival of a new god brings descent and madness and threatens to tear the starving community apart. Against the backdrop of brine and blood, Lure blurs the line between natural disaster and self-destruction. Eric LaRocca calls Lure a monstrously inventive fable, immersive and utterly compelling. Pre-order at TenebusPress.com now. Lure is out July 18th. The Crystal Lake Academy is launching this year, and the first step in that launch is the author's journey. 
Crystal Lake Publishing founder and CEO Joe Meinhard, along with several editors, including Kenneth W. Kane, Angela Yukiro Smith, and Kevin Lucia, want to facilitate your writing journey for three months, from June 15th to September 15th. You'll be part of an interactive community working to improve your craft and getting your short story or manuscript ready for submission. Find out more info and purchase options on the Crystal Lake website at www.crystallakepub.com. So today's final thought is actually just to let you know a little bit about the This Is Horror newsletter. So I'm always looking at how we can add more value for you. I recognize that most of the This Is Horror readership and listenership are readers or writers. Actually, I think these days it might even be geared more towards writers, but I'd love you to get in contact and let me know. Are you a reader? Are you a writer? Are you neither a reader nor a writer, but you just enjoy these conversations and some of the places that we go in terms of the life lessons? But anyway, on the basis that a lot of you are readers and writers, I've been thinking, how can I add more value to the newsletter? And so what I'm doing is I'm including for the readers upcoming releases and recent releases so if you've released something in may or you're going to release something in june or july if you drop me a line michael at this is horror.co.uk let me know the title of the book the author the publisher and the release date and then i will get that into the newsletter So that is for recent releases or forthcoming releases. And then the second thing is for writers. And I thought, well, what do I want to know as a writer? I want to know where I can submit my work. I want to know current markets that are available. So we're including that in every This Is Horror newsletter. So if you're a publisher, if you've got an open call for submissions that pays that's important, it has to be a paying market, then email me, michael at thisishorror.co.uk and let me know what's the name of the publication, what is the deadline, how much is the pay, whether that's a flat rate, whether that's per word, and any other pertinent information. Word count, that would be good too. What, what are you looking for? You're looking for stories, you're looking for novels, you're looking for poetry. So let me know, michael at thisishorror.co.uk. And if you're thinking you want to find out about these calls for submissions, you want to know about the latest releases, well, you can sign up at thisishorror.co.uk to the newsletter. The newsletter also includes links to every article that has been on This Is Horror for that week. Also, because last year, with all the madness going on in my life, that <laughs> continuing to go on, in fact, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of newsletters and weeks that I missed. So, as well as giving you the latest week, I'm just giving you some bonus content from the archives that I didn't manage to highlight last year, because got a little bit behind on the old newsletter. Uh, what else do you get? Well you get some writing tips most of the week you get to find out what i'm working on what i'm reading what i'm listening to so various recommendations articles tips new releases current markets so if that sounds good i mean maybe it sounds overwhelming but you know just dip into the parts that you want If it does sound all right, if it sounds like that is something that will be of value to you, this is horror.co.uk. Check out the newsletter. Sign up. All right. Well, I'll see you in the next episode for part two. Max Booth the third. Amazing writer. Great guy. Talented screenwriter. But until then... Take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing and have a great, great day.
This is Horror Podcast.